so demeaning, too demeaning to be acceptable, which is what's happened. Mm. I mean, the, the irony from my point of view, I don't mean this unkindly, is that having, having thrown the amendment back to the bishops to say uh, uh, this would make women second-class bishops, but all bishops will be second-class to the synod from now on. Because once the synod's got a taste of the idea that it can just throw something the bishop said back to them, um, it changes the sort of balance of, not of power, that's who's interested in that, the balance of authority. Mm. And for myself, I think the bishops have been weak. Uh, that's not going to make me very popular, but hey. I a bit late for that. It's a bit late, for, it's a bit <laughs> late that for me now. <laughs> I realise you're speaking as Lindsay Owen, you're mm. not uh, speaking on behalf of Walsingham, mm -hmm. but that's quite a strong uh, charge. Do you, do you want to explain a bit about, I mean, why do you think they've been weak? Well, weakness isn't always a strong charge, because, you know, in my, in my strength is made perfect in weakness, if we must always say. Well, I think, I think that the bishops reflected and they came up with an amendment, which presumably they believed to be right. Mm. And I think that they were taken aback by the strength of feeling from, uh, if I can put it this way, the women's lobby. And um, I don't think that the amendment that they put forward, well, the amendment they put forward simply made sense, as far as I can see, that um, to safeguard, to safeguard the whole thing from being sexist. Mm. Because if, if it's just enough for it to be a man, that is sexist. But this is, it is much more profound than that idea that, you know, I just don't like, I just can't bear the idea of a woman standing at the altar or putting a mitre on a head or those mm. sorts of things. That is sexist. Um, and I think that the amendments, all the amendments said was that uh, the views that are held are strongly held and with good conviction and that should be reflected in those who care for them that people people would want to be together not in a, just in a sense of you know uh, creating a cabal mm. but but as expressing their life no, I'm not putting that very well and I, and I think that the sending of it back to the bishops um, weakens the authority of the House of Bishops to be honest and I think there's an irony in that uh, in that, in that, it's all about women being second-class bishops, and I think in the whole mix of the church, um, uh, there is a danger that the bishops' voices um, don't ha have a weight about them. We saw that also, I suppose, in the rejection of the covenant. Absolutely, and once you start, uh, you, uh, and then there was the argument. Well, anyway, these are just a bunch of men, anyway. Mm. You know, you're saying some very serious things there about, um, well, representation, human representation, of how we can represent one another, uh, but also the, the role of a bishop in the life of the church. Um, the charism given to bishops to, to, to lead. So you were saying about um, the question about um, basically whether a, a male college of bishops could represent the whole church. Um, I take your point, but I immediately thought back to, back to South Africa. Mm. Um, Swaziland, a very... Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, extraordinary. Anglican bishop, I think in Africa, certainly mm. in, in the mm. province. Um, my experience there was that it's very hard for uh, women's lives, which often are full of injustice, yeah. um, to be properly taken account of within the structures of the church um, because of a male epi episcopacy. The, the balance between the authority of bishops and synods okay, is much question. more in favour of bishops there. Mm. And I must say, I, in the South African context, I think I would not be keen on there being provision for traditionalists, of whom there are many, who feel they haven't been heard. Right. But it seems to me that the, the imperative, imperative for the salvation of people in that society really does require that women have a strong voice in the leadership of the church. Yes. I know I'm not putting that in very theological no, language. No, 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 but, no, no, um, I understand, I understand, I understand. That's a, that's in, in a church that, mm. you know, reflecting the culture it comes from, is so hierarchically yes, structured, yes, yes. You, are, you are never going to get the change you need 
unless women's voices are heard yeah. in those, you know, top level mm. decision making yeah. councils. Yeah. And so actually my take on things there would be rather different from right. it is here. That's I think we are a much more, uh, we operate in a, in a pluralistic yes. way and we have many, you know, checks and balances and we have a strong voice for the laity in the church. And in the culture, we are less deferential to authority. Mm. Um, so I just, I just wanted to nuance what you were saying. Yes, so yes, I, that's I, fair. I don't know if you want, I don't no, know if you no, know the African context. I do. Well. I no, but I, I, no, that. I think that I think. Um, yeah, I don't think I can respond on the hoof. I just want, I want, I want to sort of take that away with me, really, because I think that's really interesting. Um, in, in the meantime, how's the mood? I mean, because obviously we've we've had a disappointment with an amendment failing that was seen to be. Uh, more sympathetic to the traditionalist position, um, and obviously it was a uh, it was a a knock to mm. the authority of the bishops who had proposed it. Well, they th some was to be fair. Some would say actually, uh, some bishops would say that their humility in accepting uh, the 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 rejection of the uh, of the amendment was a strength. So mm. I think one has to see the other side of it, even okay, if I happen okay, to think, okay. even but if I, I mean, I'm, I happen I'm, to think I'm, it's weak, but... I'm just but, wondering but, about the morale, yeah, the, morale. Sort of in the bit of the church that yeah. you know well, because obviously not long before that you had the ordinariate, presumably mm. that has had an impact on the sort of mood and morale of... of yes, that's, that is one of the things that's happened over the... I mean, what, uh, how does this feel from within? I think, um, I'm not sure I can speak for everybody, mm. obviously, because it people are diverse I think um, um, I think at the moment every I think everybody's just exhausted by the whole thing yeah. I mean in a sense it's sort of become however important boring you, 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 to, to, we're sort of everyone's just fed up I think mm. uh, one thinks of the text <laughs> what are we gonna do do it quick that you know if, there is a temptation to think oh well for goodness sake just get, on with, uh, get on with it it's going to happen you know I think there's quite a lot of um, that sort of feeling. I think there's a, um, I think there's a measure of anxiety, of course, but but I think that's across the whole church. I mean, um, uh, uh, you know, they're old tried and trusted methods, the structures. We all know the structures of the church are, are, are not fit for purpose, and um, that. Over time, that takes away the joy in the church. It seems to me, and especially amongst the leadership. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that that I found as an area bishop, and this is way beyond any of these arguments, is 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 that um, the structures of the church are so unfit for the purpose of evangelization um, that it weighs down those who are the leaders in it. Um, uh, um, explain a bit. Well, um, so we find priests with ten churches to look after, um, ten PCCs. Mm. Instead of facing the structural challenge, we tend to lay more burdens upon clergy, in particular, mm. um, to manage a structure that actually is, and almost, and to find virtue in it too, in a structure that probably. Um, is is no longer necessary, really, in in a, in a lively church. Take for example um, a group of villagers somewhere. Five churches, five PCCs. They all tend to think they've got to have their own PCC because if you take the PCC away, the church will fall away. Mm. Um, rather than worry, worrying more about the Eucharistic community <laughs> gathering as being the sign, um, and so we say to a priest, look after those five churches with their structures and he lurches from one to one, knowing that most of those people will get in their car and travel 10 miles to do their shop at Tesco's or Waitrose, mm. but won't travel two miles to another church building for the gift of word and sacrament. Yeah. And in the end, that's debilitating and, and wounding, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you, you, know, you, you chose an example like that, which is really to do with the, the, the failure of the church to, you know, to come up with structures that reflect the needs of the time as they change. Because it seems that, it seems to me that the 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 management of change or the um, the hope for change, the confidence required where change has to happen, is the key thing. Because we look around, the situation does seem 
pretty difficult, almost bleak, um, in terms of the Christian faith in our country. You know, mm. whole generations coming through who have no knowledge of the Christian faith and whose spiritual quest bypasses the church mm. entirely. A, a huge disconnect. Yes. Um, and I think for the Anglo-Catholic and middle of the road part of the Church of England, a huge loss of confidence, yes. loss of numbers, parishes clo closing, um, morale is very low. Um, people getting ordained now will look into a future. Very different. It's, it's going to be unrecognisable by the time they're retiring because there's going to be so few of us left by the look of it. I'm interested to get your take on the bigger picture there because you're, you're, you know, rightly uh, celebrated as an unusual species, you know, a, a, a very evangelical Catholic. Mm. Um, I know your, your heart is for the mission of the church mm. and for the gospel to spread and thrive. Mm. Um, it seems a very different set of concerns from the ones we're talking about. I mean, well, I think, I how, think, how do you see it mm. panning out? I don't know. Not to, well, say, not to say the questions about ordination and ministry are not, important. And, know, and it's all bound up with it. It's aren't. all, it's all, it's all bound up. And, and the New Testament, of course, won't allow you to dismiss, quest, dismiss questions of ministry and how the church is structured and led from the mission. It, it, it can't. In the New Testament, that they're absolutely inter, interwoven, it seems to me. Um, uh, uh, not unimportant at all. They're absolutely connected. I think what we're coming... Um, uh, well, let me... Put, let me give an insight that I've learned here, if I can put it to a, a shrine mm. or a place of pilgrimage. Um, it's made me realize um, uh, the, the, the struggle between a sacred view of life and the secular view of life. Mm. Secularity versus religiosity, if I can put it that way, because I'm not just talking about Christianity here. Mm. Um, I'm talking about a, 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 a worldview these two worldviews that are that are that are clashing and are are in conflict with each other actually yeah um, I think we we are just beginning to come to terms uh, with the breathlessness that comes from secularity actually I think secularity itself is, what I mean is it, it, it it's not satisfying it's not satisfying and it's and it's breathless in its in its lack of tolerance for a sacred worldview mm when you want to bring that sacred worldview into the secular, when you want to cross the boundary, as it were. Mm. In other words, the, the secular, uh, the sacred mindset is considered to be recreational or whatever, you can be, be religious as long as it doesn't affect mm. us or life in, in general. And we, what I find here is that all the things that we do in church normally, we do here. I mean, slightly more exotic perhaps, and devotion to Our Lady, but Eucharist, healing ministries, Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, um, but when people come here, they say, gosh, this is powerful. Now, why is it? It's because a place like this, a shrine, is, is trying to live on a bit of turf, the Catholic life, the Christian life, 24-7. Mm. Those of us who are parish priests sort of exhibit that sacred life to most people for an hour on a Sunday. So they live a secular, in the secular world, all the messages coming to us, the secular messages, they live that most of the time, it's inescapable. Mm. Then they come and they settle into the sort of a sacred way of looking at things, if I can put it that way, for an hour, an hour and a quarter. And, and then go back to the secular, and it's just not enough. Mm. Its power is almost not laid bare. It's not, there's not enough time. And I think this is a struggle for why we have such a heart for praying for priests here, because um, more and more um, uh, that, that wound is manifesting itself in, in the life of the church. And when people come here, it's, it, as a, it's only there to, be, um, to assist, one might say, um, uh, people begin to see things differently. It's a world of different possibilities and probabilities. That's why I say to young people when they come through the arch, Welcome to, welcome to a world of different possibilities and different probabilities from the one you're, you live in normally, yeah. which says that probably there isn't a God, um, and, uh, uh, 
and here we live as if probably there is.